I'll find it when we get to the slide. So just basically the side of the screen. If you come back through here, would you do me a favor? There's a mouse pad next to my computer. Would you bring it? morning. Well, we're back in church history, and if you recall where we ended up last time, we were well into the 19th century, but the 19th century is not a just straight line progression in the history of the church. No century is. We've got a series of, of loops and sine waves and things of that sort, and we're going to explore some of that today within the context of the overall trajectory. So we start out, let's just talk about a quick review here. The Great Awakening, we talked about that in the 18th century and now we're in the 19th and this proceeded in waves. There was no one great awakening. There were waves of awakenings fueled by evangelical preaching. Now a distinctive feature of Christian faith in America is the emphasis on individual response as opposed to what you're born into, ethnic identity. One of the things that's different in America as opposed to the old world is this sort of deep set cultural DNA that if things really go wrong, you can light out for the territories. Uh, until the mass uh, Emigration in the 19th century, the option in Europe of going somewhere didn't really exist. And then most of those who were participating in the mass emigration were pretty close to economic refugees, pretty close to cultural refugees. There was a good reason to leave. Uh, here we have this idea that you can light out for the territories and that you're a self-sufficient person and that individual response is paramount. And we've got this American heritage of separatism, dissent, pioneering, and the influence of pietism that we talked about last, uh, last month, uh, with the pietistic influence being dominant in the preaching of the era. Uh, this really brings about a... Uh, rebirth in preaching. If you go back and look, for example, at uh, Anglican prayer books from the 17th century, uh, and this practice would have obtained well through the 19th century in a lot of churches, you have a list of approved homily topics in the prayer book, and you have a list of approved homilies. So you get up and you read something. There is no idea of getting up and preaching. At, preaching in this era before the influence of pietism is all about instruction or warning or, or things of that sort. Uh, so this phenomenon right now is principally Protestant. The Roman Catholic presence in America at the beginning of the 19th century is marginal and will remain so until mass immigration begins mid-century. There's a Catholic presence in Baltimore. There are other smidgens of Catholics around, but it, it is a marginal presence, certainly not in the seats of power. Uh, we have at the same time in the 19th century the rise of Romanticism, capital R, uh, which increases a new emphasis on the traditional and on the sense of transcendence. Now, somebody name for me. Uh, prominent romantic poet or composer or painter or writer, somebody like that. We are celebrating the bicentennial of a famous novel this year, and it's re re resulted in a lot of resurgence of imagery from that novel and from 20th century film versions of the novel. Frankenstein. Mary Shelley, 
Mary Shelley and Percy Bysshe Shelley and John Keats and uh, uh, Keats. And it's, you know, this idea that you're going to go back to origins. Rom romance, capital R, it has nothing to do with romance, small r. It's more about, you know, the romance of living, the bigness of life, Lord Byron's poetry of the Joao, uh, the uh, musical compositions of Hector Berlioz, the uh, writings of people like uh, Shelley, the uh, uh, argument being made that the principal uh, hero of the 17th century work, Paradise Lost by Milton, is Satan. Satan is the prototypical romantic hero. The, the, the man, it's always a man in these works, the man who struggles against his fate and overcomes. Uh, so romanticism is a big deal. This is where we get Gothic from, like Frankenstein. Revival in Gothic architecture. Uh, Sir Walter Scott writing about Ivanhoe. Uh, and uh, we will dismiss this notification and see if we can. Thank you. Uh, think about that as a mix with pietistic preaching that is talking about your heart's response to God. It's a pretty heady mix. Now, the downside of all this, of course, is that it results in a lot of response to preaching being something on the basis of emotion only. As we talked about earlier, when Charles Wesley, John Wesley, I'm sorry, uh, in the Aldersgate experience talked about his heart being strangely warmed, he's not talking about getting, you know, the, the vapors. But there is a confusion of this in both the minds of many preachers and in the minds of many of those who are preached to. Uh, this sense of transcendence and new emphasis on the traditional, however, in America can take the form of self-reliance or transcendentalism. We're going to talk about transcendentalism because it will become part of the orthodox faith in America. Now, when I say transcendental about anything, what do I mean? Rising above, kind of like rising above to a perfect state. Right, you know, and not bound by time and space and matter. Things that are beyond that, things that we say are worth dying in a ditch for. Uh, this American contrast, or call it attention, between individualism and a focus on the transcendental, which uh, can be uh, part of uh, an expression of individualism, but ideally is not. This contrast will remain as a key identifier of American Christianity. Something outside of yourself. Now, in the 21st century, late 20th century, we've heard a lot of people talking about looking inward and finding truth. That's just Gnosticism rearing its head up again. Gnosticism is never going to weigh. It's a, it's a very popular spiritual force in America in our era. Looking outward is more the transcendental approach. Looking inward is looking for that private light that is somehow secret. Uh, we are going to see at the same time a Catholic, capital C, Roman Catholic identity, which is arising independent of heredity and independent of formation. There will be people who become Catholics who were not born Catholics in America, and that is a new development. Uh, we will see a Catholic identity arise founded on the rediscovery of individual faith response set in motion through pietism. And so uh, part of the new health that gets injected into Roman Catholic practice about, you know, what I say and do and believe and how I view this and how I participate and how I am changed by my participation in worship matters is going to be a result of pietism and evangelical preaching. 
Uh, we t we've talked before that you could not have the Oxford movement in Anglicanism, the Anglo-Catholic movement, without the Methodists having an influence on individual response. Uh, this Anglo-Catholic movement, of course, is countercultural, but it is proudly counterculture. It wants to testify against the culture. And so we get stages in development that we talked about before, starting out with study, then a focus on ritual, and this transmutes into hard work. The early Anglo-Catholics are principally slum priests, going into the worst slums with the idea being that it's amidst ugliness that you start showing people the beauty of holiness and changing them. Uh, we get phases in development. Uh, academia, it starts out in universities, principally Oxford, also Cambridge. Then it moves into parishes, and then it transmutes into a life of service. A principal emphasis is the beauty of holiness, and there is a concern for social order. In other words, we're way before the social justice gospel here, okay? Why would there be a connection between a focus on the beauty of holiness and a concern for social order. Anybody want to hazard an opinion on that one? What is the nature of ugliness in classical theology? It is disordered. In other words, if you're in a terrible situation in a slum, this is not God's will. God's will is beauty and blessing and things that are in harmony with the order of creation. And the ugliness of a slum uh, reflects the ugliness of sin, that we have not lived into God's will for ourselves and for the human species, and we have imposed our own will on the created order. Now, let me see where she wanted me to click ahead. There we go. It's, a, it's, it's hiding from me. Okay, this is a trick. Okay. Uh, if we look at the early developments in Roman Catholicism in America, the Catholic Church has actually been in America longer than any other church body. Now, we grew up in the 20th century with the Pilgrim Fathers myth about everything, and so we heard about the Pilgrims in the Bay Colony in Massachusetts. We heard about Jamestown with the Anglicans running around in Virginia. But of course, from the 16th century, you have Roman Catholic priests running around what used to be part of Mexico in Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and California. When I was in Santa Fe in July, I noted that it was the oldest capital city in the United States, that it's a city founded in about, I forget, 1540 or something like that. And uh, one of the differences about the Roman Catholic approach was vis-a-vis -vis the Native Americans, you went ahead and baptized them and incorporated them in the church. Now, you might exploit them economically, <laughs> but you didn't treat them as non-humans not worthy of salvation, unlike our Puritan friends in the Bay Colony of Massachusetts. Uh, as I said, however, the, the Catholic presence was marginal because the American consciousness is not being formed at this time by what's happening in New Mexico or Texas, which are foreign territory to most quote-unquote Americans. Uh, and the Catholic presence, even in the original colonies, is further marginalized by the British triumph of 1763 in what we call the French and Indian War, would otherwise be called the Seven Years' War, which extended rule over areas which had been under French or Spanish rule. This is where we start seeing where uh, the French government out of Quebec is starting to be pushed away in influence in the Spanish government in Florida, for example. Uh, there is a vicar apostolic in North America. There is not a bishop. 
The vicar. What, what does the word vicar mean in English? Is it related to the word vicarious? Exactly. It's from vicarious. A vicar stands in the place of the bishop. So a vicar apostolic stands in the place of the apostolic see. This is a vicar of the pope. Uh, there's a vicar apostolic with jurisdiction over the colonies, and he appeals for a bishop to be sent to America. Uh, this was resisted by the Jesuits uh, because there's a lot of anti-Jesuit sentiment, uh, sentiment in Rome at the time. There are internal battles going on in the Vatican over who's in charge of what. And by 1773, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits will be formally suppressed and disbanded. They're, they, were, they are declared null and you can't be a Jesuit. And so the Jesuit missionaries who had been in North America become secular priests under the authority of the vicar apostolic. Now notice how this works. You don't want Jesuits in charge, so you don't send a bishop. So what happens? The Jesuits in North America become the real missionaries. <laughs> that worked really well. People thought that one through, right? Uh, so American Catholicism in this era is a creation most strongly influenced by the Jesuits. What are the Jesuits known for? What do we still know the Jesuits for? Teaching. Teaching. This is where we get the whole Catholic school movement from. There's a focus on education. Uh, we have a Catholic presence centered in, mainly in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Now again, I don't want to say that everything that happens in America is East Coast. Because as I said, there were priests a long time earlier in the Southwest, but they're not part of a national conversation at this point. They're part of a conversation within the empire of Spain, New Spain. So they're not part of the American conversation yet and won't become so for quite some time. It's going to take 1846 and all that before we really see that starting to get formalized. Uh, in the post-revolutionary period, uh, we have a focus on internal organization with the most prominent figure being John Carroll. He will become Archbishop Carroll. He's consecrated the first bishop in America, in Baltimore, in 1790. Uh, Carroll succeeded in establishing a great increase in priests in America, working with the French Sulpicians. This is out of the Church of Saint-Sulpice, and that's the sixth arrondissement in Paris. And so they actually succeed in establishing a seminary in Baltimore in 1791. Once went to a wedding where the head of homiletics at that seminary preached at the oldest Anglican church in uh, Baltimore. Uh, we get Georgetown being opened as a university in 1791. Incidentally, Georgetown Prep will take some more time before it develops. This is a university at this point. Uh, we have St. Elizabeth Seton, who dies in 1821, the patron saint of our local Catholic grade school. Uh, she's a convert from Anglicanism. Now notice that. The idea of conversion to Catholicism in America, while rare, is something that happens, not something that happens very often in the old world. Uh, she is, uh, establishes a teaching order of Catholic religious in 1809. Again, from the beginning, the Catholic Church in America is strongly associated with education. It's about lifelong formation. By the time Baltimore was established as a metropolitan see, in other words, the bishop is elevated to the rank of archbishop. Here's a little technical detail for you, okay, canon law, uh, that works in both Roman canon law and Anglican canon law. A bishop is called an ordinary, and an archbishop is a metropolitan, 
because an archbishop has jurisdiction over ordinaries. In a religious order, an abbot, an abbess, a prior, whatever you want to call them, is an ordinary. And so, but they're not referred to as most reverend the way you would, or, or right reverend, rather. Most reverend would be a metropolitan, right reverend would be a bishop, an ordinary. You don't refer to an abbot as a right reverend. This is a sign of monastic humility. Although they have within their order the same authority as a bishop. And the way we take care of this in terms of how an order relates to a diocese or to the wider church, not an individual diocese, is that most religious orders have an Episcopal visitor who is a bishop appointed to come from the outside to have certain Episcopal oversight, but only in an advisory role, not in a jurisdictional role. Um, well, by the time we get the Archbishop of Baltimore, there are probably there are about 80 Catholic churches in America, with 70 priests and 70,000 church members. Now, do the math there. These are big churches, right? They've always been big churches. We have uh, episcopacies established in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Now, at this point, we don't know the numbers for Louisiana. Louisiana is French territory and Catholic, but we don't have the numbers here for this. And again, they're not part of the national conversation yet. Uh, this is roughly contemporaneous, though. The Louisiana Purchase is, what, 1804? So things are starting to happen there. Uh, there's a lot going on. Let's keep going if I can track down where this elusive next is. Did it do? Yes, okay. And we're still talking about Roman Catholicism in America. We get Irish immigration becoming the main factor now. It's always been a factor, but post-1820 it expands and then explodes in 1847, the famine year. Uh, a principal part of the Irish diet, what's keeping people alive, is potatoes which are what? An import from the New World. Who's brought potatoes first to England? Sir Francis Drake. So a pirate has brought them to England. He's been given letters of mark by the crown and has been cruising around as an independent privateer to attack Spanish things, and he gets potatoes their origin principally being what we now call Bolivia. Well, they take over the Irish economy of, of subsistence, basically. And then in the 1840s, we get a infection in the potatoes. I forget. It's a species of oedium, I think. No, no. Phylloxera or something like that. But at any rate, it's a fungus that attacks the root of the plant, and it collapses. What happens? There's mass famine. If you go back, incidentally, and look at the debates in Parliament, because there is no Parliament in Ireland, remember. Parliament's in London. And if you look at the debates in Parliament, there are various uh, schemes proposed to provide relief for the Irish that go nowhere, principally because they're opposed. And so a lot of Irish basically are starving to death. And they're trying to get out. In the 1830s, we get about 200,000 in a decade. Uh, by 1845 to 47, we get 780,000. By 1860, there will be 1.6 million Irish in America. And this is going to give rise to tension between Irish and German Catholic communities. Uh, that's going to persist throughout the 19th century. Uh, I used to live in Rochester, New York. And on the north side of town, which was almost universally Hispanic and black when I lived there, you would see four very large Catholic churches within eyesight of each other. You know, within a half mile square, there'd be these towering churches, and you'd be like, what's that all about? That's the German church, that's the Irish church, that's the Polish church, and that's the Italian church was the way it worked. 
I was familiar with that in Philadelphia as well. That was there were ethnic identities in in brands of Catholicism. Uh, these tensions are going to be ex exacerbated by ecclesiastical preferments. Who gets appointed as a pastor? Who gets appointed as an administrator in a diocese? Who gets appointed as a bishop? And this is going to remain subject to French influence because it was the Sulpicians and the Jesuits who were the original missionaries running around. And Carol, you'll note Carol is an Irish name, has been working with the French to get this to happen. So there's some tension there that the French are the inner circle in the church. Uh, Post-1880, well, I mean, we're really fast-forwarding here. We're going we're gonna to get the arrival of Italian immigrants, but that's going to be focused initially on the coasts. You're going to get groups of Italians who will be brought in, essentially as 19th century indentured servants, into the Mississippi Delta. They're still called Delta Italians, and you know, they start out working as farm laborers and now own half of Mississippi. But the... Uh, uh, this is mainly a coastal phenomenon with the Italian mass immigration. The Irish and the Germans are much more prominent in westward expansion. They're the ones who, you know, if the city doesn't work out too well, you keep heading west. By the time we get to the Battle of Little Bighorn, most of Custer's 7th Cavalry will be German or Irish, including many who do not speak English. He will have a color sergeant who dies at Little Bighorn, who is a survivor of the Charge of the Light Brigade in 1854. The only surviving member of his command who makes it out will be an Italian who doesn't speak English, who's the bugler, Johnny Martin. Uh, Johnny Martini. Um, I knew his descendant, Johnny Martin, who was a priest in uh, Five Corps of the United States Army, originally been a New York City police officer. Uh, so the Irish tend to head west, partly because of discrimination against them in the east. The Germans tend to head west because their focus is more on, they've been getting out and away from restrictive land laws in Europe, the Falk Laws, for example, under Bismarck, and they want to specifically establish their own place. That's gross oversimplification, but you know, some of the forces at work. The Roman Curia here remains at some distance from the American experience of a multicultural, pluralistic, and individualistic society well into the 20th century. As a result, the church in America rapidly develops her own identity that is Different. It's a different brand of Roman Catholicism than what you would experience in the old world or uh, the rest of the world. Uh, Catholic identity in America becomes much more associated with Americanism and patriotism. Uh, Catholic identity is less hostile to modernism and political liberalism. When Pius IX publishes his encyclical Syllabus of Errors, uh, the church in the U.S. basically explains how this is really not inimical to democratic institutions. Because Pius's Syllabus of Errors includes a lot of critical language about modernism as expressed in representative government. Pius is still more focused on uh, the reality of the divine right of kings, for example, and how power is hierarchical from above. And so the Catholics in America have to kind of say, well, here's how actually what the Pope says doesn't really apply. I mean, and w churches have done this for centuries, right? What's said really is different here, and here's why. You know? uh, by the 1860s, there will be more than three million Catholics in America. Only in Missouri was the church denied the right to own property. Square that with the Constitution. This just came up again two, three years ago in a case from Missouri that made it to the United States Supreme Court 
where a Lutheran-run school had applied for funds under a state program that provided funds to make playgrounds safer for little children. And uh, it was just a program to put in rubber, you know, stuff and things like that. And the state of Missouri denied the funding because the Missouri Constitution said you could provide no money whatsoever to any religious institution, even for secular neutral purposes, just they were, they were right out. That eventually was declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court about two years ago, I think it was. And so uh, if you said that you, you were providing money to provide religious instruction, okay, you can say no. But to sit there and say any school in the state of Missouri can get funding for, uh, you know, playground safety enhancement, but not you because you happen to be a church, that's where the Supreme Court got. Uh, but Missouri uh, was notable for uh, uh, an anti-Catholic animus. And, of course, we've got a prominent Catholic university in St. Louis, St. Louis University. So there's always been a little bit of a fault line there. Uh, a church which in Europe was used to being either in the majority and allied with the state or excluded from hostile states is a black and white situation in Europe, adjusts to being in a minority position in a pluralistic society. Things are a little more gray. Uh, and uh, one of the results of the identity of the church with the immigrant population is that the church becomes a champion of democracy and social justice. Protestant conversions to Catholicism result. Now, this is why by the 20th century, uh, early 20th century, the Catholic identity in America is going to be much more allied with the Democrat Party. And so when Al Smith runs for president in the 1920s, one of the principal pushbacks against him is what? He's a Catholic, right? You know, and so the Ku Klux Klan is really big in the 20s, right? And they're going to say, you know, this is a problem. He, of course, gets defeated by Calvin Coolidge. But the uh, even as late as 1960, Jack Kennedy has to, like, establish his bona fides to the American Legion, saying he's not going to be subject to the Pope. Why? Because people are arguing that he will be. Uh, so there's an adjustment going on here, and it's in part reflected in how we get some stereotypes here. So first we have uh, John Carroll, a Jesuit you know, who ends up as Cardinal Carroll, Archbishop Cardinal. And then we have here this Thomas Nast cartoon from Harper's Weekly in 1871, The Usual Irish Way of Doing Things. And he's sitting on gunpowder, he's got a shillelagh and a bottle of whiskey, and looks subhuman. And you can read the uh, things in the background. Now, it's not a joke Oh, it's, it's actually not a shillelagh, it's a firebrand. It's not a joke to point out that you could find a sign in a New York bar in this era that would say, no dogs or Irishmen. I mean, this is just, you know, I mean, look at it. And this, Harper's Weekly is the largest weekly publication in the United States in 1871. Incidentally, this is the same cartoonist who gave us our modern uh, concept of Santa Claus. You know, the big guy with the beard. No, that's Thomas Nast as well. So you've got this whole thing going on with the Catholics, and we get sort of a, a whole American religious milieu. It's a little bit more of a stew pot here. As we've seen in the convergence of Catholic and American identities, America becomes a nation with a unique religious sensibility. And we still claim this, right? And if you compare the uh, number of uh, America, the percentage of Americans, whether or not they're practicing the faith, who claim to be Christians, and the percentage of Americans who claim to be atheists, 
and compare that to European populations, there are wide, wide variations. Uh, about 85% of Americans claim to be Christians, profess to be Christians. How many of them are practicing is very debatable. About 3% of Americans claim to be atheists. 31% of Frenchmen claim to be atheists. Uh, because of the history of the identification of the state with the church in many parts of the old world, not in France for the last two centuries, there's this idea that if you are, you know, going to make it on your own, you kind of have to be opposed by the, to the church. You, you, you define the church as part of the culture rather than as the counterculture. And the great danger in 20th century and early 21st century America is this Christian nation myth that, you know, if you're part of the establishment, it's the, you know, the, the church, right? It used to be that people would talk about the Episcopal Church as the Republican Party at prayer. Never quite accurate to start with. But uh, this idea that in the 50s, for example, you know, if you're from the right side of the tracks and the right sort of person, you go to the right church, uh, infects the faith with, you know, we're part of the establishment. The, the, the founding fathers in their wisdom did not say a church cannot be established by a state to protect the state, but to protect the church. And to the extent that the church is now losing her position of privilege in our society in America, this is probably healthier for the church because it is allowing us to recognize that we are supposed to be the counter culture from the get-go under Jesus Christ, right? He's not sitting there saying how we can make the temple prettier and how we can, you know, cut a deal with the Romans, right? and make sure that uh, we all get the right, you know, bond payments. The church, I'm preaching here, sorry. The church is a radical institution, and making it part of the establishment doesn't recognize that. But that's what happens in America for a long time, for almost 150 years. And so we get this, what's called the national period, from the revolution to the civil war. We get a climate of public opinion which emerges founded upon the image of the free individual having full opportunity to develop his or her potential and talent and or talent. Now his slash her is being a bit generous because uh, obviously there's still a lot of patriarchy that would prevent most women from developing their potential and talent, but in theory, uh, we get, this one's going to be important. This one's going to echo with us through the rest of American Christianity. The individual and society are potentially perfectible. We can make things better in this world. Therefore, we have to remove restrictions on behavior, individual behavior, because democracy is about freedom but requires perfectibility focused on progress and equality. In practice, people don't want to be equal, right? But they like the theory. You know, some animals are equal, but some animals are more, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than other animals, animal farm. We like the theory that we're all equal until we draw distinctions between ourselves. We get an uh, identity based on paternalism and voluntarism. Others must be persuaded to participate in progress. We know what's good for you, you know? We're going to come out with a program that will change the society this way. Now, in our own current political debates, We've kind of moved beyond uh, the labels of liberal and conservative. Uh, people who uh, claim the mantle of modern liberalism as opposed to classical liberalism tend to call themselves what? Progressives, right? 
Uh, so this is, this is alive and kicking. Uh, we get civic values of freedom and democracy being linked with evangelicalism as a form of national religion. This is what it means to be American, right? Truth, justice, and the American way. You know, Superman is kind of like into all this. Uh, and there's a sort of religious nationalism that evolves here, a common social grammar based on common religious principles. By the 20th century, this is going to be called army Protestant. You know, if you're a, an army chaplain in the 20th century, unless you're a Roman Catholic chaplain or a Jewish chaplain, I mean, you're a Protestant chaplain. It doesn't matter whether you were educated and raised as a Methodist, a Baptist, an Anabaptist, a Seventh-day Adventist, a, you know, holiness movement. It's Protestant. And this done this way, which is very much focused on individual virtue, individual response, respect for order, things of that sort. And army Protestant becomes kind of a common grammar. It's not called that, obviously, in uh, the megachurch movement. You know, it's, it's about, you know, how we're good citizens and good people. Uh, that's a sort of a uniquely American Christianity that will be exported a lot. But why is the megachurch movement so successful? Because it gives you, no matter who you are, something. You come into, I don't know, Willow Creek or something like that. And first of all, it's big and there's a lot of stuff going on and there's music and there are comfortable theater seats and there's a Starbucks and you can get your coffee and come into the worship. And uh, there's a form of entertainment involved. But then, if you were, say, a uh, mother with young children, here's the program you're in with other mothers with young children. If you're a single man in his 20s, here's the men's fellowship for men in their 20s who might do a very good social ministry like fix cars for poor people or something like that. They may establish a whole garage at the church just to have you know, the working poor's cars fixed. These churches do wonderful work, but it's about how you're going to be a better person. That's going to get morphed in a very destructive way into the prosperity gospel in some churches, that God wants to bless you, and here's how you live into that blessing. But this is part of background noise in American Christianity coming out of the 19th century. Uh, we get a strong element of revivalism. This is a trope in American literature, right? Uh, this is the, the guy who shows up in a tent. Uh, revivalism replaces establishment in maintaining moral order. There are no powers that be, well, there really are, but, you know, there are no powers that be on the frontier, but then the reverend so-and-so shows up, the preacher shows up, and you have a tent revival for, you know, three days. And this is to make sure that morality is maintained. Revivalism is very much associated with morality, whether it's sexual morality, whether you put a moral component to the consumption of alcohol, whatever it might be. Since there is no established church looking over your shoulder in a parish structure that parallels a political structure and saying, oh, here's what you do and we're going to sow a red A on you, it becomes a revivalist thing about how your heart is responding to be following Jesus in purity. I mean, this is why uh, Christians overseas can sometimes look at American Christianity and kind of cock their heads one side, although we've succeeded in exporting a lot of this now. Uh, by the last quarter of the 19th century, the Episcopal Church has an image of stability and primitive roots. We're the ones that go back. And because of the romantic interest in origins, there'll be some people that are attracted to the Episcopal Church just on that cultural basis. Because we have pretty churches. And we do them right, right? Uh, but this harmony is shattered in the Episcopal Church by what is called the second ritualist controversy. 
Now, what was the first? We had the whole Oxford movement, right? And so there are already battle lines being drawn here. But then we get John Henry Hopkins publishing a book, The Law of Ritualism, in 1867. Twenty-eight bishops. In other words, about oh, probably half of the bishops in America at the time condemn the book publicly. What are conde what's condemned? Candles on the altar. This is popery, right? Candles on the altar. Incense. Reverence to the altar. Eucharistic vestments. Wearing a chasuble. Wearing an owl. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to wear a cassock and a surplice with a tippet, not a stole. You're not supposed to have candles. You're not supposed to have incense. You're not supposed to reverence the altar. You're supposed to be a proper Puritan, Calvinistic type, Church of England type that way. This is when James de Coven is elected Bishop of Wisconsin in 1871, 74, 1870s at any rate. He's actually elected bishop twice. He's elected bishop of Wisconsin and bishop of Illinois. I forget which order. And uh, as you know, when a bishop is elected in the Episcopal Church, they require the election requires the consent of all the other bishops, or the standing committees of all the other dioceses. Uh, twice, de Coven does not receive consents because he has candles on the altar and a choir wearing choir robes. And so the window of James de Coven at Neshota House has him vested with a stole on. I think he's wearing a cope, actually, with a stole. And there's a bishop's mitre at his feet, since he never got to put it on. But uh, the de Coven Center is the diocesan retreat center for the uh, Diocese of Milwaukee in Racine. Uh, where we live is part of ground zero of some of this controversy, which is why there's going to be such a blow up with the installment of the suffragan bishop of Fond du Lac in 190 oh, whatever when Tikon is here. Uh, the preacher at the installation of the new dean of the cathedral two weeks ago, referred to the photo and said that it was published on the front page of the New York Times the next day. That's not actually true. Uh, partly because the New York Times in 1908 wasn't putting photographs on its front page. But the photo was published in the New York Times. It was within a week. They didn't have radio pictures going back and forth. This was news. You know, the, 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 these people are up to something and trying to subvert Americanism, right? And look, there's a Russian archbishop here as part of it, right? You know, uh, who the Times refers to as what? A foreign prelate participating in a popish uh, gallimaufry or something like that. You know, I mean, I doubt there would be much reporting in the current version of the Times as to who's installed as a bishop, unless we, I don't know, we have our first transgender bishop or something, that'll make the paper or something, but. So, we've got battle lines being drawn, right? Uh, we're gonna go for one more slide and then we'll take a break. Because we're gonna finish the American religious milieu and then we'll take a break. Now, general convention meets, of course, every three years and in this era does not explicitly condemn ritualism. They don't have the votes. But we get the assistant bishop of Kentucky leading a party to form the Reformed Episcopal Church in 1874. It's still around. It has a seminary in Pennsylvania. Uh, we get the bishops, the House of Bishops, declaring at the 1871 convention that episcopacy is plene esse, but not bene esse. Now, let's define those terms. When we talk about uh, things in the church, what we do, how we do them, we have to worry about, is this essential to the faith? Or is it just good? 
If it's bene esse, it means, well, we can argue about its merits and say if there's a better way to do it and whether it is salutary to the health of the church. But if it's plene esse, we've got to do it. It's required. It's part of the faith. It is dogmatic. It is bedrock doctrine. Now, let's use an absurd example. Is it plene esse or bene esse in making Eucharist that we use bread and wine? Or could we make Eucharist with potato chips and Coca-Cola? Yeah, it's plenty essay because Jesus says bread and wine. Now, there's a church within stone's throw of us that had a uh, minister in a prior incarnation uh, literally do it with potato chips and Coke one Sunday to make a point about how nothing's really happening here. This is just how we get together, right? If you take the view of real presence as a... Yeah, you're actually right in Anglicanism, Lisa, because we say that we believe in the real presence, and we don't define how that happens. And so if we're of the party that believes in transubstantiation, we say that the substance of the bread becomes Jesus' flesh, the substance of the wine becomes Jesus' blood, etc., if we were more Lutheran and argued from a consubstantiation, we'd say, well, the substance of the bread doesn't change, but the substance of Jesus' flesh shows up. And, you know, when Jesus is smart enough to jump in, he's smart enough to jump out. So if you have wine left over, pour it back in the bottle, which is what would happen in a Lutheran church. Consecrated wine would just be poured back in the bottle because once the worshiping assembly leaves, the real presence leaves, Right. We, obviously, as a church that has a tabernacle with reserved sacrament, are taking a transubstantiation viewpoint. Most Episcopalians never think about this. They just say Jesus shows up somehow. The third possibility in real presence is that Jesus is somehow spiritually present in the gathering of the people. If you take a Eucharistic doctrinal position that does not define what's happening with the elements, then you could argue that it's been ASA. If you take a Eucharistic position that is uh, something's happening in the elements, then it's plein ASA. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some fudge there in Anglicanism. Uh, let's think of another example. Is it plein ASA or bene ASA that Jesus, in the biblical record, names disciples who become apostles who are men. In other words, is maleness bene esse or plene esse for holy orders? Well, obviously, we've got two women here in the ordination process for uh, uh, the church. Uh, we're, we're taking a bene esse uh, viewpoint here, right? Uh, and we could even make an argument from the biblical record, although I'd have stones thrown at me in certain circles, by pointing out that the first person actually commissioned to take the good news to the apostles is Mary Magdalene, the apostle to the apostles. So minor detail. But uh, where we get in fights is, is episcopacy plene esse or bene esse? Is it just how we organize the church and we like doing it this way and there's an advantage to having bishops and three orders of ordained clergy? Or is it necessary to the economy of salvation and how the church functions as a holy mystery? And the position taken by the Episcopal Church, hence our title, and by the Catholic Church and by the Orthodox churches is that episcopacy is plene esse. Now we're going to see how this develops. We get, uh, we'll see that on the next slide, but we get uh, the idea here that the priesthood is royal 
but not ontological. Now let's define some terms there. In other words, what the bishops are saying in 1871, and this is not going to end up as a majority opinion within the church, they're saying that you are called to the royal priesthood and you occupy an office. Ontology is the branch of philosophy that relates to being, to the soul. And so if you say there is ontological change, you say that once the Holy Spirit is called down upon you as a deacon by the bishop laying hands on you and using the right form in the ordination ordinal, that your soul is changed in a way analogous to the change in your soul that happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in baptism. Now, nobody's argued that baptism does not involve ontological change in these debates. Uh, if you were a Baptist, if you were a Presbyterian, you'd say there is no such thing, ontological change here, and we do this as a memorial for what Jesus do, did. And the change is in your heart, and we're recognizing what changes happen. I've never really quite understood how we can have a change in our heart, and that's any different from a change in our soul, but minor point, right? Ontological change means that holy orders is a sacrament. Now, we say in the Episcopal Church, how many sacraments are there? Seven. Okay, you're in a minority position. Because our catech I say seven, too. Our catechism says two dominical sacraments, baptism and Eucharist, instituted by the Lord, and calls the other five sacramental rites rather than sacraments. And so in a classic Anglican fudge, it leaves open the possibility of ontological change. We can look at the diaconate, or we can look at the priesthood, or we can look at the episcopacy as something that is functional. You get trained to be a deacon, and we could train a lot of people to be a deacon. We could train people to do what I do on a Sunday morning. What we say from a sacramental viewpoint is there's ontological change. The soul of a priest is changed in some way to be conformed to Jesus' existence in a different way. The soul of a deacon is conformed to Jesus in a different way. So what the bishops are saying in the 1870s is they're not going there. They're not going there with a sacramental view. They're saying that the priesthood is royal, but not ontological. So royal in a functional sense. Very Lutheran uh, approach here. If we were uh, four of us shipwrecked on a desert island, and none of us was in holy orders, and we were good Lutherans, and we wanted to make Eucharist, what would we do? Bake bread. We'd bake bread, and we'd sit there, and we'd decide who was going to preside at the Eucharist, and we'd lay hands on him or her and say, you are the presiding priest for this. And maybe six months later, we'd do somebody else, something like that. You know. And so we would not say that it has to come with the laying on of hands from a bishop who's in apostolic succession, etc. We'd make it functional. Once we worry about it being ontological, then we get all these things about apostolic succession and what happens when we talk about the form and matter of a sacrament. If we look at the form and matter, if we take a sacramental view, I'm going too long here, sorry. If we take a sacramental view of holy orders, what are the form and the matter? The form is the ordinal, the actual, how we call down the Holy Spirit using these words, you know? Because Jesus says in baptism, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? Which is why we would not except a Mormon baptism, because they only baptize in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But we'd accept the baptism of somebody from any church who was baptized with water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. We're saying that's the form. And so the form in ordination, at some point the bishop is gonna put hands on your heads, and it's not, they always feel really heavy. It's like, this, you know, like they're pushing down on you. 
and say, and call down the Holy Spirit to make you a deacon. Read the words in the, in the ordination service. That would be the form. What's the matter? Humanity. This is my argument with those who are all about, you know, women can't be priests. I'm like, the matter here is not maleness. There is no such thing in hylomorphism of sacramental theology. The matter is humanity. Maleness at that point becomes an idol. And uh, I... I'm really a pariah in certain circumstances because I argue that restricting uh, ordination on the basis of gender is a form of idolatry. But so much for that preaching. Uh, We're going to keep going here. Um, What else do they say? The altar does not involve sacrifice. Look at this. This is a Calvinistic viewpoint. There's no fresh sacrifice on the altar. Jesus is not present in the elements. Does this sound anything like the Episcopal Church you've experienced? No, there are going to be some pretty significant changes. This is classic old-line Calvinistic Protestantism. Baptism involves regeneration independent of moral change. Okay, they're going to throw a bone to ontological change there. They'll draw a line at baptism, right? But there is a reaction. The Calvinistic party does not hold the day. General Convention 1874 adopts the ritual canon, which tolerates ritualism as a surrogate for saying we're officially tolerating your Eucharistic and sacramental views. We'll let you do these things. And we'll continue to disagree about what happens when you do these things. The laity is a lot more open to the elements of the Catholic revival than the hierarchy that's been raised in a more Calvinistic uh, environment. By 1904, the canon on Eucharistic adoration will be dropped because until then there's a canon that says if you were to put the consecrated host in a monstrance and put it out there, you know, between, I don't know, Monday, Thursday, and the Good Friday Passion, and have you, we're going to charge you. You're, you're going to be charged under canon law. You can't do that. This is why John Mason Neal ends up being inhibited for 21 years in the Church of England, because he institutes Eucharistic adoration in a chapel. Boom, you can't function as a priest. This is why, I forget their names now, they were in our last lecture, Uh, the three priests at the Round Church in Cambridge, England, who moved the altar against the wall, are imprisoned by order of the Privy Council. You know, we're going to see this, these battles are continuing in the American church. We're going to take a five-minute break and then continue into the broad church movement. I'm going to eat more double stuffs and you'll get a sniper rifle and uh, climb a water tower. uh, (laughs) Okay, we need to... Wait, is she in there? No, you just leave it going. Unless we're saying something more crazy.
displaying her usual intellectual curiosity. <laughs> but I, I, if it was up to me, and you could never do this, and it wouldn't work for a lot. But I always thought that, you know, this, this is stuff that people should know in their faith, that you know, lifelong formation should let people know where we come from and why. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there is Okay, where are we? We've gotten to the broad church movement. Uh, we're going to get what's called the American Church Congress in 1874. Note the date, the same year Episcopal General Convention adopts the ritual canon. We get Philip Brooks at Trinity Wall Street promoting a certain comprehensiveness. Now, Trinity Wall Street remains very active. I mean, they're the only Episcopal church that has their own monthly magazine that gets published to the rest of the church, right? Uh, Trinity Wall Street is, by most estimations, the wealthiest parish in the world partly because most of Lower Manhattan is owned by it. And all those buildings have ground rents they pay to Trinity Wall Street. I think the last uh, estimate or the last report of their endowment was upwards of a billion dollars. So, A year? A year? No, endowment. I think oh, they're – but if you uh, look at endowment income on that, you know, you're probably looking at, oh, I don't know, 50 million – well, at that level, you'll do more like 80 million, but then the, the ground rents would probably be another couple hundred million. So uh, their endowment, uh, you know, and their 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 income statements are kind of going to be different that way. Um, Trinity Wall Street is a parish. Well, I mean, it's obviously a lot bigger than any church in the Diocese of Fond du Lac, but it has a full-time staff of 127. You know, most of which are in the publications department or something like that, or the foundation or whatever. You know. There are Trinity Wall Street grants. We looked at applying for a Trinity Wall Street grant in relation to our anti-trafficking activities. Uh, you have to be invited, however, to apply for a Trinity Wall Street grant. So, by doing things that show up on their radar screen. Uh, Philip Brooks promotes comprehensiveness, a reaction against narrow evangelicalism and Calvinism, a reaction against an insufficient conception of the incarnation. He's looking for kind of a middle way here. The broad church party, I'm throwing some names out at you, are basically the circle around the general seminary in New York City. And they want to enter into dialogue with modern science, 
They want to allow for higher critical methods in biblical hermeneutic, and they developed the idea of the Episcopal Church as a bridge church within the national consensus of the evangelicals and the Catholics and that milieu. Um, what do I mean by uh, higher critical methods? Everything we've done in, say, the your study of Old Testament has been higher criticism. Lower criticism would be, is the manuscript accurate, has it been accurately transcribed, what are the variations? Higher criticism would be, well, it looks like there are four different writers here in the five books of Moses, and here's what one's concerned about and another concerned about. Those would be higher critical methods. Those would be very contentious matters in the 19th century and remain so in a lot of the broader church, right? It's that, you know, you're questioning the authority of Scripture if you say that maybe Moses didn't write Deuteronomy. You know, uh, the, the idea of that being okay emerges in this era. Now, that takes us to the next slide and we get a book published in 1870. Incidentally, all these figures, Philip Brooks and uh, William Reed Huntington, and who was it that I mentioned earlier, uh, John Henry Hopkins, they're all in lesser feasts and fasts. They're on the church calendar. But there were certainly debates when they were added. Uh, the church idea, William Reed Huntington, he publishes a book that says, there are four marks or notes of the perfected church. Visibility, the indwelling spirit, unity, and the capability of perpetual renewal. The comprehensive principles of church identity are scripture as the revealed word of God, the creeds as the rule of faith, the two dominical sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. What do I mean by dominical? Instituted by the Lord, dominus in Latin. Uh, that, that in scripture, Jesus directly does this. The others might be implied in terms of what Jesus is doing. And the historic episcopate in apostolic succession. Now, this becomes a formula for proposed church union and is adopted as the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, first by the House of Bishops in Chicago in 1886 and second at the first Lambeth Conference in 1888. The Lambeth Conference itself <clears throat> is called on the basis of an American proposal that all Anglican bishops in the world get together. And so the Americans lobby for a long time to make this happen, and eventually the Archbishop of Canterbury issues an invitation, and it becomes the Lambeth Conference, which happens once every 10 years. So if you look in your prayer book on the historical documents section, you find the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral, and it says that the basis of us getting together in the church, capital C, our scripture is the revealed word of God, the creeds is the rule of faith, a sufficient rule of faith. The two dominical sacraments instituted with the elements and words specified by Jesus and in scripture. And the historic episcopate and apostolic succession. And they add in the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral as adopted to local needs. And so they're going to leave you some room on how you do this and say, this is how we can get churches back together into one church because the one church needs to be unified and visible. And that this is an example of capability for perpetual renewal and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> one of the offshoots of this is the idea of a national church as the vehicle for the social gospel. You know, this is, this is when stuff's going on, right? And so general convention proposals are made to drop the word Protestant from the title of the church. Because at this time, and until, what, 1979, 
What's the church called? The Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States. Or no, the Protestant Episcopal Church of America. Then we get it called, in 79, ECUSA, right? Episcopal Church of the United States of America, which is inaccurate because we have nine provinces, one of which is overseas in Latin America. So then it finally gets renamed the Episcopal Church, TEC. Uh, but General Convention is saying, well, let's not call ourselves Protestants. And there's a reaction to that. And the positioning is going on here to make the Episcopal Church sort of the American Catholic Church. But it doesn't succeed. But note that we start at the same time the work on the National Cathedral. How did the Catholics feel about that? They are filthy Protestants. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. The American Catholic Church, I would think that they would not take kindly to that. I have had uh, people in this community refer to what we do on Sunday as a play. It's not worship. You're doing play acting because you don't have any real sacraments. You aren't really a priest. You know, you're, you're not a member of the church, therefore you're a heretic. And none of what you do matters. It's void. You know? So how do you even respond with that? <laughs> I mean, or do you just say, you already... Bless your heart. <laughs> I know what that means. Yeah. Uh, well, you first have to determine if they're willing to sit down and actually talk and listen. And then say, well, let's go back to what Pope Leo XIII said in Apostolicae Curae, because where your argument is coming from is there. And so let's say that the Pope said that Anglican orders are null and void. What was the basis? Of, and you go back, and they're not going to listen to you at that point because the Pope said it, right? You know. So uh, now the flip side of that is I've also uh, dealt with people in this community, and when I say people, I'm talking in this case ordained people right. who would say that the Catholic Church isn't the church mm -hmm. at all. It's a whore of Babylon in Revelations, you know. And so I mean, if you're going to take those party positions, you're not going to get real far in terms of looking at church unity. Uh, diocese becomes smaller, <clears throat> named after the sea city as a center for liturgy, mission, and education. So we go from the Diocese of Wisconsin to the Diocese of Milwaukee and the Diocese of Fond du Lac and eventually the Diocese of Eau Claire. Fond du Lac gets found, the, the Diocese of Wisconsin gets reorganized when? 1875, right? This is right when this is happening. Uh, Huntington pursues as well liturgical reform with a focus on enrichment and comprehensiveness in use. So we get the 1892 Book of Common Prayer, which is not just the 1789 prayer book, which is not just the 1662 prayer book filtered through the Scottish prayer book. There's some different things happening here. The 1892 book allows for transfiguration being part. We say that the body and body, we are asking the Holy Spirit to come down upon these elements that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That language is used. We get canticles. You can sing Magnificat or say Magnificat or say the... The, the prayer book now, you know, the, the canticles we use at morning prayer, evening prayer, the Song of Simeon, the, the first, second, and third Song of Isaiah, the, you know, the, the uh, Song of Zechariah, these start showing up in prayer. Uh, before that, you'd only be using Psalms. Flexibility in office, how you do the daily office there, it doesn't have to be the same way every day. You can use different canticles. You can specify things as being the eve of a feast. You can sing. You can, you know. Um, prayers for mission and prayers for church unity. Now, does anybody have a prayer book with them? Let me see your prayer book there a minute. If we go to morning prayer, thank you. 
Well, the one we like to quote, Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your heart, arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. And then we go on and ask how we can, you know, be made to do the same, right? If you look at the daily office, morning prayer, or right to, that's on page 101. And there's this nice little uh, rubric on page 100. Before we get the three prayers, it says, Then, unless the Eucharist or a form of general intercession is to follow, one of these prayers for mission is added. And we get these three prayers. Now, they go on to say, in the case of the one I just uh, quoted, you know, we're reaching out so that all might come within the reach of Jesus' saving and praise. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. The other two we talk about, the whole body of the faithful people being governed and uh, praying for all members of your holy church, or we say, oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth. These are reaching out. This is new. This is not about how we are gathered here together. This is a focus outward. That doesn't happen till the 1892 prayer book. Uh, the net effect of all this comprehensiveness is to advance Anglo-Catholicism. We're trying to define ourselves other than the frozen chosen, a narrow sect where we do it right and you don't, which has very much been that heritage that came with being, you know, the original powers that be in many of the colonies. And here we have the National Cathedral. Now, <clears throat> put this one in your pipe and smoke it in the uh, concept of current uh, ideas of the separation of church and state. The Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, the Washington National Cathedral, uh, the movement begins in the 19th century, but the building actually begins in 1907 pursuant to a charter granted by the United States Congress to establish the church. What do you do with the establishment clause in the Constitution? Bit of a problem there, right? But see how Christianity, not real Christianity, but cultural Christianity has become the cultural background in this era. Of course you do this. Of course you pray at these events. That's what we do as good Americans. Uh, and the cathedral is uh, designated in this act of Congress as a national house of prayer. And it's still used that way a lot of the time. When something really you know, big's going on, there's something at the national cathedral. Who lays the uh, cornerstone? A good Dutch reformed man, but the president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, lays the cornerstone for the National Cathedral. And there are a lot of people who think that's a great thing and that's what we need to do, right? And let's go back to that, where the government's doing this stuff. <clears throat> let's, we're going to go back a little bit here, because now we're going to focus specifically on Anglicanism. Post-Civil War social developments and concerns. Uh, the, the war is generally thought of, and really was, a second revolution, the establishment of the Second Republic. And if you say the Declaration of Independence is sort of the uh, clarion call of the establishment of the First Republic that gets really sort of codified in the Constitution and the preamble to the Constitution, what is the herald's call for the establishment of the Second Republic? It's not that long. Go read it. Would it be something by Lincoln? A second inaugural address. Uh, you can find books written on Lincoln's second inaugural address as really defining who we are as a country. And a lot of what he talks about in his second inaugural address just blew up in the last year or two in the United States. And we're acting a lot more like a people on the pathway to civil war of one form or another. 
In the Civil War, issues left unsettled in 1787 are resolved. Not to everybody's liking, but they're resolved. An industrialized urban America triumphs. Capitalism is freed from restraints. Americans espouse a sense of virtue and destiny, manifest destiny, right? You know, let's kill all those Indians. Faith is expressed in republicanism, the national religion, that sort of army Protestant I talked about, and capitalism. The population increases from 31 million in 1860 to 76 million in 1900. With a six-fold increase in urban population, Chicago goes from 100,000 to 1.7 million. Imagine that. Imagine that scale of, if we say that Sheboygan has a population right now of about 50,000 and said that in a time period of 40 years, we would have a population of uh, 850,000. It kind of boggles, you know, 850,000 would take us, I don't know, to Port Washington or something like that, you know, or how far west. You know, you'd have the metropolis going out past Plymouth. It'd be a different, and people live through this, right? You know, and so if you grew up on a farm and suddenly, bam, why is it that Chicago burns down because a cow kicks over something, right? Because there's a farm there. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, uh, things are changing, right? Progress is viewed as a sign of divine favor. The Lord has poured forth his blessings upon us, and we are the city on a hill, a light to the world. Think of how we've looked at ourselves as Americans, right? You know, city on a hill, light to the world. America has a special place in the world. This still is a, a narrative in a lot of political discourse. We get Andrew Carnegie, poor Scottish immigrant who becomes, you know, the, the hugely successful steel magnate as the evangelist of the gospel of wealth, the self-made man, the rugged individualist is the ideal. Mark Twain will label this the Gilded Age. And now we have people in our day and age referring to this as the second Gilded Age because of the wealth disparities and the fact that, you know, if you're in the right place at the right time with the right idea in Silicon Valley. You, know, you can now, I don't know, have your own jet airliner and a couple palaces and, you know, a cruise ship. And that's just kind of, you know, the way it works, right? The 1% of the 1% of the 1%, you know. This is what's happening in America at the time. Uh, Ulysses Grant, the hero goes from a farm near Galena, Illinois called Hard Scrabble, where he's always a failure and he gets reinvented successfully. Turns out it doesn't hurt that he's a really gifted writer. And so his autobiography is a fascinating read. It's really worth reading. Doesn't uh, hurt that he's a man with many weird pathologies that he's not so afraid to hide and talk about how you can be different and make yourself into something different. Herbert Spencer emerges as a thinker, and so we get social Darwinism. The reason people are successful is that the successful succeed, and those who don't, this is just how Darwinism works. It's, it's evolution. If you're stuck in a slum, it's because you're inferior. If you're successful, it means you're superior. This is going to lead us to, you know, Nazism at some point here. But, you know, social Darwinism is uh, considered part of the normal discourse in, you know, polite society. We get an explicit connection made between success and Christian living. So the gospel of prosperity isn't just a late 20th century phenomenon. It's been preached uh, before. Uh, but here it's not even being preached in a church context so much. This is just the cultural background. That if you're successful, it means that uh, you're living right. Uh, religious spokesmen are very complacent. 
You know, in the prior century, we saw how the Church of England was kind of dry and focused on preferment. Same thing's going on here. Episcopal Church, 1874, be content with your wages. Uh, Dwight Moody Revival, we get the Chicago Moody Bible Institute, where we get all our good two, four-time hymns that you can march to, you know. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. You know, these are brass bands, right? You know, there is no TV, there is no internet, there is no radio. So what do you do for entertainment in 19th century America? They're town bands. We still have one in Kiel. You know, they march. They're brass bands and gazebos. In England, they tend to be in string orchestras. You know, this is how you hear music. And so the Moody Bible Institute, the Holman Moody hymns, or what are called Moody Sankey hymns, they're all march beats. Uh, Dwight Moody, God has blessed this nation. Now, think of the songs we sing. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Here. God shed his grace on thee, you know, America, America. You know, I'm not knocking them, but look at the background noise we're dealing with here and where some of this comes from. We get four great upheavals that shake this complacency and faith. The 1887 railroad strikes. The Haymarket riot in Chicago in 1886. Now, incidentally, what do you do with major labor problems in this era? You call out the army, and the army opens fire on strikers and things like that. You know, there, there are pitched battles. The Pullman strike is a pitched battle involving artillery, you know, and a gunboat and things like that. Uh, you get the Carnegie strike, the Homestead strike in 1892, the Pullman Company strike in 1894. There are pitched battles going on that in the old world will end up in things like the Russian Revolution. Here, we see the emergence of what is called the Christian social movement which is focused on how do we actually engage these great disparities of wealth. Nobody would say privilege back then. That's our 21st century language. These great disparities of wealth and opportunity. And the Episcopal Church is the first mainstream church to uh, welcome this. We've got Philip Brooks here. I'm showing you his face as the broad church movement. And we've got William Reed Huntington there, the church idea and the Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral. Now, this leads us to where American theology starts developing more. The important, there are really three important movements in American Protestantism that arise in the century following the Civil War. We're not going to get to all of these because one doesn't even arise till post-World War II. Really, well, a little bit before that. We get liberalism, which we'll define, fundamentalism, which we'll define, and neo-orthodoxy. Let's look at the characteristics. Despite very real differences in these theological movements, each bears a relationship to Americanism as understood by a majority of Americans. American culture is viewed as unified, and there should be or is a harmony between secular and religious elements in society. Pluralism makes distinctive traditions and identities non-threatening. Now, again, we're seeing a move away from that in our own era. Uh, and so, again, just going around this town on a walk, you will find houses that have signs that say, Hate is not welcome here. No haters here. Now, regardless of the sentiments that the people might be trying to express in that, as soon as whatever we're arguing about here, whether it's gender identity, sexual identity, racial identity, immigration status, you name it, all our cultural battles, if I decide that because you take a different position than I do, that you're a hater, I just write you off. And so that old identity of pluralism, of how we tolerate different views, goes away. And rather than sit there and say, why do you disagree with me about, you know, let me hear your argument about whatever, immigration. You know, I just say, you're a hater. 
if you disagree. So where we started out and then emerged into this sort of broad pluralistic consensus post-Second American Revolution is now under fundamental threat. And we're getting back to the same kinds of identities that resulted in the Second Revolution. And you could find people out there now on the internet and the airwaves talking, arguing for a third American Revolution. Uh, the, because these differences are viewed as non-threatening. If I define you as a hater, I'm saying you are threatening. Faith is a personal and inward phenomenon and not an ecclesiastical or institutional phenomenon. It's about the change in my heart. A church is an institution formed by voluntary association and fellowship. Notice this is not a holy mystery ordained by God, right? Theology is focused on the personal and inward elements of belief. Faith and religious identity are defined not in systematic theology, but in praxis, in what you do. Are you living a good Christian life? Religion is therefore pragmatic and oriented ethically. Religion's about how you live. Character, behavior, social attitudes are interdependent, and theologians are essentially ethicists. You know, what's a good life look like? And let's, let's argue about how you maintain that and what you struggle with. The social, secular context of life is accepted. All creation is not fallen. God's plan is being brought to fruition. A promised land is realizable. Necessary corollary, monasticism is rare, right? Religious life is oriented to the secular. Faith has her face turned to the world. There's little emphasis on the transcendent. It's how we help people, right? It's about, it's all, and we can all name a lot of churches we know that that's, that's all they do. It's, it's how you help people. It's whether you're a good person and a good neighbor and a good citizen. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it's very incomplete versus, you know, oh, the holy mystery of the church. Reality, truth, and value can be found in the observable world. Well, we're not going to disagree with that, but it is very much a focus on the observable world. Now, as I say, there are positive aspects to this. The creative element in theology is engaged with the culture. It's relevant and alive. We're trying to deal with people's real problems. We're trying to, you know, actually comfort the afflicted and try to change their lives. What's the negative aspect? Well, the close identification of religion and culture gives rise to the danger of nationalistic spiritual pride. We're good people and you're not, right? We're good white Christian Americans and you're, you know, trying to cross the border or something like that and you're going to change things in here and come in here wearing, you know, different headgear or something and, uh, you know, we don't want that, right? It's, now. These things go in, you know, sine waves, obviously. And so if I sit there and, you know, make that argument, and I'm serious about it, I'm not putting my tongue in my cheek about being good white Christian Americans, and you show up in a turban and you look different, I'm not going to give you a lot of opportunity. And so you being an enterprising lad or lass are going to, well, you wouldn't be wearing a turban as a lass, you're going to sit there and say, well, here's how we're going to establish our own niche. And you're going to take over the taxi business in New York or something like that. Or, you know, this is why we see ethnic identities in particular industries and neighborhoods, because people say, well, here's the channel I can operate in and read between the lines. You know? <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, so there are positive and negative aspects to this sort of American cultural theology from the perspective of real transcendentalism, real spiritual 
warfare, real uh, presence, all those things. This is more background noise than what is happening when Jesus is really calling us because uh, when Jesus issues his call and says, follow me, where is he inviting us to follow him to? The promised land? The, the cross. The cross, right? It's not to blessings and you know, to the cross. And so the idea of the church as a sacrificial institution, it's, you know, uh, being a deacon, a sacrificial identity. No, it's about how you're going to, like, join the right, you know, uh, club in town and, you know, meet for breakfast and do things and get things done. You know, you raise money for this. Again, positive aspects. But that sacrificial identity of the cross is lost in this. And in God's infinite wisdom, to the extent that the church loses her position of privilege, we start regaining our identity as those who follow to the cross. Liberalism becomes allied with the social gospel. And I said back up on slide five, the individual and society are perfectible. How do we realize the kingdom in this world? Fundamentalism and neo-orthodoxy, we're not going to discuss today. They are two totally separate strains, and we will have to do that next time. But we're going to, we're going to keep with this sort of whole idea of the American religion. Now, missionary outreach in America. If we go back to our first class, we recall that the Episcopal Church, in the Episcopal Church, the most active force in missionary church planting was not found in any party with any established heritage, but in Anglo-Catholicism, the counterculture within the church. And so what developed in the post-Civil War era in missionary outreach is going to reflect some of that. Uh, if we recall as well that the church is viewed and experienced as a means to establish moral order on the frontier, how do these come together? Well, missionary outreach is identified with theological liberalism, the social gospel, and the settlement house movement. We're going to define these. Roman Catholicism is focused on defending against nativist hostility. You know, we're good white Protestants and you're not. And resolving its own internal struggles provoked by papal condemnations of modernism. You got Pius IX with his syllabus of errors and it's kind of in conflict with the American idea of things. Missionary work in America is focused on church planting targeted to existing and expanding Catholic population centers. But then we get Leo XIII in 1891 issuing the encyclical Rerum Novarum, Revolutionary Change. And this incorporates a new teaching on social responsibilities, socialism and Unrestricted capitalism are both condemned. Labor has the right to organize. The wealthy have an affirmative duty to the poor. Now, uh, in Rerum Novarum, for example, is where we get the Catholic social doctrine that an employer owes, in the terms of Rerum Novarum, a working man, a living wage, by which he can support his family. And so uh, the export of jobs to low-wage areas overseas would be contrary to Catholic social teaching in our era. But this is pretty revolutionary in 1891 for the Pope to recognize the right of a labor union to exist and say, you've got to give somebody a living wage. You can't keep them in these Dickensian conditions. Uh, Affirmative duty to the poor, hmm, that's problematical, right? Until you go back and you read uh, Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus. As deacons, one of your callings will be to point out to the church who's Lazarus lying at our door. But note that when the rich man is in torment, there's no record of him doing anything wrong to Lazarus. 
He just ignores him. Jesus, in teaching this parable and saying, you've got Moses and the prophets, you don't need any more warning, is saying, draw the conclusion. There's an affirmative duty to act. Moralism and right living and be following Christ do not only involve what we refrain from, but what we do. It's a lot easier to specify what we refrain from, right? Uh, Lutheranism in America is focused mainly on assimilating immigrants. And so uh, uh, an urban Lutheran parish in this era is a huge operation that is kind of like its own social network with its own mother's union and its own way of taking care of sick people and its own way of providing education and its own way of, you know, paying for doctors for the poor in the parish, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a big deal, you know. Um, and it tends to be ethnically identified, German, Swedish, whatever. Uh, so if there's a problem, a, a disaster in a church, you can get a neighborhood wiped out. When the steamboat, the General Slocum, burned on the East River in, what was that, 1903? I think it was 1903. Um, it was an outing for a particular Lutheran church near the Battery, and the neighborhood ceased to exist because 1,200 people got killed on this one vessel when the church went all out on its outing. This all happened within sight of Manhattan, right on the river, you know, things on fire and going along, and uh, the uh, uh, Lutheran churches are social organizations as well as churches. Uh, Within the liberal theological framework, we get a focus on social and ethical improvement, targeting the disadvantaged. How do we improve these people and lead them to improvement? Congregationalist churches, particularly in New England, are the most active in missionary outreach with a focus on social improvement. Uh, and so we get, as a result of this movement in liberalism, what becomes known as the social gospel. Uh, under the social gospel, the moral and rational powers of humans must be given a broader scope than creedal confessions, more about what we say about Jesus and salvation. Sin is considered to be primarily error or dysfunction. Nowadays we call it Poor decisions, right? Uh, the primary focus, is, the missionary focus, is therefore to teach, to show those in error a better way to live without a primary focus on the confessional content of the faith. We're not so worried about whether you can say the Apostles' Creed. We're worried about if you're sober. Uh, we're not so worried about what you say happens in baptism. We're worried about whether you're married and having your children. Uh, and you can see these strains are still around us, right? Now we would sit there and say, well, we first have to meet people where they are, and we're not going to preach the gospel to them. That way. We're just going to, you know, get them off dope. And then maybe we have an opportunity to preach them the gospel. In reality, what happens a lot is we don't want to go there with the gospel. We just want to focus on doing the works, right? One of the things that uh, we've had pushback on from churches in this town as we are working to develop a sober living facility for females in Sheboygan is we keep talking about doing this, you know, because of our Christian faith and allowing people to hear the gospel. And we've had churches in this town say, you're preaching to them. We just want to provide money for a safe space. We'll take the money. But, you know, I mean, we have in, uh, I'm not going to name names here, but uh, in love in the name of Christ, we say, you know, we're not about doctrine. So as long as you can sign on to, whether you use the creeds or not, if you can say that what you say about God is described somehow sufficiently in the creed, then you can say you're part of the loving movement. We've had two churches that have the Apostles' Creed in their prayer book say, we can't say that because it's exclusionary. And so if it's all about how you get people to change their living situation, we see that this 
is a strain very much alive. And there are churches that get identified just by their works. You know, we're about fair trade or we're about, you know, this identity or we're about this. And you're sitting there going like, where's Jesus in this? You know, uh, we get the settlement house movement. Uh, the goal is to get the rich and the poor in society to live more closely together in an interdependent community. The main object is the establishment of settlement houses in poor urban areas in which volunteer middle-class settlement workers live, hoping to share knowledge and culture with and alleviate the poverty of their low-income neighbors. The settlement houses provide services such as daycare, education, and health care to improve the lives of the poor in these areas. Now, I made an argument for this four years ago. When the nursing home across the street closed down, I wanted Loving to buy it. I said, we can get 38 churches to raise a couple million dollars, and we'll say all of the people we're trying to get out of generational poverty don't know what we're talking about, so we're going to live together with them and have a place where people can live for a year and then graduate into their own apartment. Everybody thought I was nuts. But this is not a new idea. Uh, the idea is you have to establish community with somebody before you can talk about any change. Congregationalists, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians are prominent in the settlement house movement. Most prominent Episcopalian, probably the most prominent person in the settlement house movement is Vida Scudder, who was the first woman to receive a doctorate from Neshota House, an honorary doctorate given in 1942. And in 1942, Lord Halifax, the Viscount Halifax, who had been the British Foreign Secretary and as soon as Churchill became Prime Minister, got packed off to the United States as ambassador to the United States to keep him out of the way uh, because he was considered to have Nazi sympathies and be an appeaser, and uh, Churchill was able to have the FBI watch him in the United States. He was supposed to come to Neshota House to get an honorary doctorate at the same time, and his train was intercepted by the FBI because there was a dangerous radical at Neshota House, and that was Vida Scudder. <laughs> and so he didn't actually show up for his doctorate. <laughs> but, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, of course, we get the Catholic teaching here of Rerum Novarum, you put that together with the settlement house movement and you get a theological coalescence into the Catholic worker movement uh, centered on Blessed Dorothy Day, who is principally active from about 1970 through the 1940s and remains very much a figure in Catholic social teaching and debate. Domestic missionary outreach is primarily a phenomenon driven by independent Christian ministers. This is the preacher who shows up in town. Planting congregations on the frontier. Broadly Protestant theology, but will become more specifically fundamentalist or Pentecostalist post-World War I. Major denominations will not focus on domestic mission in any organized fashion in the pre-World War II era. Uh, there's some foreign mission. The Presbyterians are active in China, for example. But, you know, domestic mission, not going to happen. The idea of going and planting a church in a slum, not going to happen. You might get a settlement house, but those are those radical lefties that do that. And here are some faces for you. We've got... Uh, Walter Rauschenbusch, who is the one who puts this all in writing, a theology for the social gospel, Lutheran uh, seminary professor. You get Josiah Strong, uh, Our Country, Its Possible Future and Its Present Crisis, very much a congregationalist viewpoint on this, a major fundraiser. You get the Strong Hospital in Rochester, New York, the Strong Foundation, Vida Scudder here. You see she has a very long life, the Settlement House Movement. And Dorothy Day, also fairly long-lived with the Catholic Social Workers Movement or the Catholic Workers Movement. And 
If the church, capital C, is more focused on herself and how we do things on Sundays, these people start becoming the face of the church to the unchurched. Prior to World War I, foreign missionary activity by American churches is very limited. Missionary activity is generally confined to planting churches attendant on the expansion of settlement of North America and the taming of the frontier. There are isolated examples of mission activity uh, related to resettlement schemes for uh, freed slaves in Liberia, uh, some missionary activity in the Pacific Islands, uh, particularly the Marshall Islands, and in China. China becomes a particular focus for organized mission by the Presbyterians. Anybody remember the book or the movie, The Sand Pebbles? Right, well, you know, the, the guy who's you know, on the gunboat going up and down the river, there's the nice missionary girl, and she's there with the Presbyterians for the China Light Mission, you know, that's somewhere west of Chengdu. Uh, we get the American Baptist Foreign Mission Society organized as early as 1814. Uh, and they did conduct organized work in Burma on a small scale. They eventually are not going to survive in Burma, and by the 1830s, the Church of England is going to take over what they've done. And we have six or seven members of this parish now who are from the Karin ethnic people who've been Anglicans since the 1830s in Burma, Myanmar. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, first translation of the Bible into Karin is about the same time period. Uh, the Philippines will become an additional focus for Protestant mission following the Spanish-American War. Before this, of course, the Philippines have experienced evangelism from the Catholic Church. Foreign missions from American churches are almost exclusively a Protestant enterprise although you do get some Catholic orders doing this. The Norbertines, for example, up here in De Pere, active in foreign mission. Uh, various Franciscans active in foreign mission. Various Jesuits active in foreign mission. Uh, foreign missions from the Episcopal Church are focused primarily on the translation of Scripture into other languages. Uh, this is something coming out of the General Theological Seminary. So we get Blessed Samuel Shadashevsky, uh, who is active in Japan and China and translates the Bible into Japanese. Uh, we get other Episcopalian mission work being restricted more to Native Americans and in Alaska. The only hospitals in Alaska get founded by Episcopalians. Now, it used to be you could tell which was the Episcopal hospital in town in most states by its name, St. Luke's. And so St. Luke's, Milwaukee, was founded as an Episcopal hospital. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, if you were a nursing student at St. Luke's Hospital in New York City, in addition to those really weird little nursing caps you had, at 5 p.m. throughout the hospital on the PA system, you gathered in chapel and sang evening prayer. And that went throughout the hospital. It used to be you would find in the... Uh, emergency room in most St. Luke's Hospital, that prayer we love from evening prayer, keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, and all for thy tender mercy's sake. Now, the reason I know that prayer so well, in addition to saying it in evening prayer, is my first introduction to the prayer book was long before I'd even been baptized, long before I ever went to church. There was a uh, woman in the medical examiner's office in Philadelphia when I was working at the medical examiner's office in junior high school. That's a different story. Uh, and she was what we would now call on the spectrum, way out on the spectrum. Forensic pathologist dealing with, you know, unexplained deaths. Dr. Liu, 
And so for uh, unclaimed bodies being buried in the pauper's graves in the Tinicum Marsh in Philadelphia, any time there was an unclaimed body that eventually got buried, Dr. Liu would dress in white because that's a Chinese mourning color and go and be present for the burial with the sanitation workers and say prayers over the body. And I started going with her. I went to all these, you know, unclaimed body burials and heard all these wonderful prayers from this prayer book. And uh, so I well remember, keep watch, dear Lord. But the, uh, because she was saying that for those who didn't know this person but might miss him as well. Um, now, post-World War I, the establishment of the United States as a world power leads to great expansion and mission activity, particularly in the Pacific, because we get mandates under the, you know, League of Nations, right? This activity is greatly accelerated post-World War II and extended into other regions, spearheaded by evangelical missionaries, particularly from Wheaton College, and Pentecostals. Uh, I've got the movie. You can probably find it on Amazon or Netflix. It might be worth having a movie night some night on this screen called The Tip of the Spear or The End of the Spear. And it's about Nate Saint and the other martyrs in 1947 in Ecuador out of Wheaton College where they go out and they're trying to establish contact with an indigenous tribe of warriors and they end up being martyred. It's a really very good movie, and it involves the son of one of them going back and try, and he actually meets the the uh, tribe, the, and they find the old airplane and things of that sort. And uh, it's a very very well done movie. You can borrow it, or we can have a movie night here sometime for adult ed, um, or it's probably on Netflix or Amazon. It's called. It's either the end of the spear or the tip of the spear. I think it's the end of the spear. Um, Roman Catholic foreign mission work involving American churches has generally been organized through religious orders. The Jesuits, the Franciscans, the Premonstratensians is the official name for the Norbertines. Uh, how are we doing here on time? That's our last slide. Look at this. We've left ourselves an hour for discussion. We've left ourselves an hour for discussion and question and talking about teasing all these different elements out. And uh, oh, I have questions. Okay. I mean, this has been kind of a fire hose. I'm sorry, but let's go with questions. Let's go back and look at any questions that uh, come up. So um, uh, let's move the microphone over in case anybody's watching us. Okay, so I had a question on, um, in regards to the Christian social movement. You say that Episcopal Church is the first to welcome it. Can you entertain a guess, guess as to why? Like, 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 I don't buy it that they're just like better Christians, so they did it. Usually other things motivate people. Was it because they were just that spiritual, or was there something in it for them? It boils down to individuals. Yeah. Those boils down to individuals. And so without going back and teasing out the details of the lives of particular individuals, if we look at Vida Scudder, for example, uh, she's from what we would now recognize to be a position of very considerable privilege in the Northeast. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit lays upon her a charge to use that privilege. Uh, and she's very persuasive. You don't want to brook her. And, I mean, uh, for a female to be leading males into the slums and establishing settlement houses in this area, she's got to be a very powerful mm -hmm. individual. If you sit there and say that the Episcopal Church in people like William Reed Huntington are saying, how do we actually focus on church unity and because this is one of the visible marks of work in the church and the presence of the spirit it means we've got to be out in the world it means we have to focus outward and so what becomes the Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral theologically starts pointing us outward a little bit more it's not because Episcopalians are just good people 
any more so than any other denomination. It's just that the, the ideas have consequences. All ideas have consequences, but the, the, this several decades, multi-decade process of an outward shift theologically probably means that you're on the leading edge of that curve more. And if you look at what's going on at the General Seminary in New York, I mean, it's kind of a hotbed for this sort of thing. And since this is sort of the, the General Seminary at that point is the incubator for most bishops, you, know, you start saying, and the Philadelphia Divinity School, which doesn't exist anymore, but a similar kind of seminary that's going to be very urbanly oriented. Uh, now, some of this boils down to class privilege and economics mm -hmm. because the preacher on the frontier who's shown up on horseback isn't from a wealthy, established church where he can get a salary and have a rectory built. He's going out to the territories because there's something in him that's part of that pioneering spirit. And so privilege affords the those who are active in the Episcopal Church in the social, Christian social movement, the luxury of doing this. If you are, you know, in an Irish slum in lower Manhattan, well, first of all, you're going to be a Roman Catholic, but let's assume you're Scotch-Irish mm -hmm. and you are, you know, off the boat and you're in Kentucky now. Yes, God could call you. A burning bush could show up and you could go, you know, like, you know, be a missionary on the frontier and some do. But it's not from a position of privilege that you're now going to go into the, you know, poor areas of Lexington or Frankfort and Louisville and say, how do we establish a settlement house? Because that takes money. And uh, to put a similar model across the street here, we were going to have to raise three and a half million dollars. I thought that was perfectly doable in the context of, you know, a bunch of churches working together in the county. But, you know, it, it requires money. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? What has struck you in this as new? something you had never thought about in the history of the church or of the Episcopal Church or of Christianity in America, something you're like, huh, where did that one come from? Or something that's resonating right now as an echo of a prior conflict or movement. I was going to say, I feel like some dots have been connected mm -hmm. from things I've learned as a child and just ideas that I took with me and I'm thinking of things I learned in college and I don't really know how it, I, have, I still have to process it but it's just like yeah it's like wow well if a deacon is supposed to be <clears throat> the principal bridge between the church and the world and between the world and the church issues like outward focus issues like uh, what's the content that is specifically faith-based and what is the content that is focused on the building of relationships and getting together with people. These are going to be fault lines in the development of your own ministries that will be uh, shifted as well by whoever you end up serving with. If you end up being assigned to a parish where the rector doesn't want a thing to do with the social gospel and thinks it's, you know, it's a Clinton conspiracy or something like that, you're going to be challenged in terms of how you say, I think we need to establish a safe facility for trafficking victims. And I think we are called to this ministry, to this immigrant community, and we really should be working on this language. On the other hand, if you go to a place where that's all the rector's about, good works, and you want to focus on the inward life of the sacraments and the spiritual development of people within the church, you're going to have challenges. And so the unfortunate thing is we're called to the plenitude of the church, but we tend to identify in sort of party lanes. 
and you know whether we're Catholic or evangelical or whether we're high church or low, and we 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 use those labels to take party positions, and uh, can also shut each other down on that basis. But so. I thought it was interesting to see how even it just in prayer book changes, how we shifted from one side to the other and back again, um, and actually being able to line it up with this was what was going on. Because I, I see that right now. I see, you know, people at St. Thomas, or I mean, it could be anywhere, but of course I spend more time there, you know, who select one thing as the most important thing to, to them. And I found that sometimes I have, an, I have a difficult time understanding. I don't understand it. I hear what you're saying. That Why are we going to die belief. in a ditch over this? Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's helpful for me to say, okay, this is what was going on when this type of theology started forming. And they're, you know, they're expressing a position that supports that. Maybe it can give me better insight into just trying to understand how how do you believe this thing is the most important. So it was, for me, it was just interesting to see that switch back and forth. Well, in our own lifetimes, in the Episcopal Church, we've seen prayer book revision. That's starting again. We've seen the ordination of women. We've seen uh, the ordination of gay people. We've seen the blessing of same-sex unions. Every one of those has resulted in people leaving the church. Now, in theory, every one of those has resulted in some people coming to the church as well, although the numbers don't balance out. Not that you thereby become less attractive to certain groups, but that you're seen to be conflicted when people are fighting and suing each other and leaving or whatever, from the outside you look at something and you see conflict and you're like, why would I want to be part of that? And so the idea that, uh, you know, if we're inclusive on matters of sexuality, we're just going to get a whole bunch of people that have been excluded in society to become Episcopalians hasn't really panned out. Because even those who might otherwise be spiritually seeking within a same-sex relationship see a conflicted institution. And so, I mean, we've seen just within the last decade the formation of a parallel Anglican church in uh, the United States that in itself has allowed several other splinter groups to come under one umbrella under very different theological positions. Uh, I mean, the Reformed Episcopal Church and the Anglican province of Christ the King are on polar opposites on, you know, high church, low church issues. And now they're all within that sort of ACNA umbrella, right? Uh, you know, the, the Nigerian church is in a very different place theologically from some of the other groups within that umbrella. But if we go back and say the Civil War is the second American Revolution, where things really get sorted out, and a really large proportion of the population gets killed or otherwise traumatized. 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, I mean, this is all fresh experience to everybody. They're living it. One of the reasons why we have the stereotype, which is very real, in the south of a sort of a matriarchal structure where, you know, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, and there's always that formidable woman in town who gets things done, is in the deep south post-Civil War, the men were dead. The women were in charge, you know, in the home. Uh, or you could say that the first state budget in the state of Mississippi after the Civil War was 1868, the state was still under federal occupation, uh, but the federal government allowed the state to have a state budget, and 70% uh, of the state budget was for artificial limbs. Wow. These are not productive, you know, huh. leaders now if you're spending your money on legs and things, you know? And so 
that's a fresh, raw experience that people are living for generations. In our own day, we're seeing a sort out of generations from a number of wars. Uh, theology is supposed to lead to cultural change, but it always reacts to it. And then we see in the next generation the theological reaction affecting the culture. And uh, we are formed just in how we speak and how we view reality by what's happening around us in the dominant philosophy or theology of the day, whether we admit to that or not. We're either agreeing with it or reacting against it and we get into arguments. But the changes in 19th century America are so massive that they're bound to be theological reactions and they become dominant in the 20th century and now we're moving into a different era with the theology that is responding to 19th century problems or changes. And it doesn't mean you throw it all out, it's all bad, you know, but it's like we're still struggling with that and always will. So. It's, you know, when we argue today about <clears throat> sexuality, when we talk about inclusion for same-sex relationships and how those unions are blessed, et cetera, et cetera, we can make passionate arguments about that on either side of any equation. But we sit there and we write off most of the rest of the Anglican communion like they're not part of us. I am not one of these people that just thought that the last presiding bishop was, you know, a heresiarch or something like that. There were a number of things I disagreed with her about. She clearly is a very intelligent woman and clearly has many spiritual gifts. But I remember listening to a speech that I thought, oh my, 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 if, you know, because basically she was being questioned about the reaction of the African archbishops to the uh, consecration of Jean Robinson as Bishop of New Hampshire. And the African bishops took a very strong line on homosexuality, all right? And she said, well, in 50 years, they will be where we are. They are not enlightened to the extent we are. Words to that effect. I could go back and find the speech. And I'm sitting there going like, Wait, she said that to the Africans? But they no, in an American context of an interview. Okay. I think it was Terry Gross on, uh, I think it was an interview with Terry Gross on National Public Radio. And I'm sitting there going like, that's one of the more racist statements I've heard in a long state, in a long time. At the time, my next door neighbor at Neshota House was Archbishop uh, Bernard Malongo, who was the uh, Archbishop of Central Africa province of Central Africa. <clears throat> he's got a PhD from Cambridge. He's got, you know, and I'm like, he's like this really smart, you know, educated guy. And I'm like, you know, if, if that just smacks of racism. Now, I'm not saying she was a racist and that we need to like take her face off of things or something like that. You know, we all screw up in interviews, right? But we take a very American-centric or Western-centric view on what it means to be an Anglican Christian. And we write off the fact, we have a very small minority of the Anglicans in the world. I mean, the Church of England still is trying to be the, you know, the tail that wags the dog. There are 29 million Anglicans in Nigeria. How many are there in England that are actually in church? You know, about a million, right? You know, we have about 800,000 practicing Anglicans in the United States and maybe one, twice that number who identify as Anglican. If we look at the worldwide population of Anglicans being something like, I don't know, 85 million, we're, we're saying you people are wrong. Now, I'm not saying that they're right. I'm not saying that we're right. I mean, I, I, what I'm saying is, one of the things that is characteristically American and Western is we say we're it. And so we get into these battles like we're defining it for everybody. 
if you put that, remember when we talked about the different identities between old line, real, you know, separatist Puritans in the Bay Colony and Connecticut? They're all about changing this world. And so the fact that the, the people who end up sort of settling San Francisco and, you know, establishing a hierarchy there, mainly out of Boston, you can start seeing the fact that, you know, you've got California and the Northeast being aligned politically is not too surprising because you're sitting there and saying, our worldview is we know better and we're going to make your life better by making these rules. You know, it's that, that nanny state sort of thing that people used to complain about with the Labor Party in Britain. Uh, and so you get a nativist or a know-nothing revolt that says, you know, we're rugged individuals and so you're not going to tell us what to do. You know, you're going to get my gun when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers, you know. And uh, same tensions throughout that whichever side of the equation we're on, we're saying, uh, you know, we know better. I mean, I quoted this in our theology class the other night. One of my least favorite presidents is Woodrow Wilson, for a number of reasons that I don't need to elaborate on. But one of the things that Wilson was uh, not known to do was entertain other viewpoints. And he was a very private man who didn't really share what he was doing half the time with many people. He did share once with his uh, principal aide, Colonel House, uh, that in the midst of some debate, he, he, he was frustrated enough that he confided in Colonel House, you know, I really feel sorry with people who disagree with me. And Colonel House was like, really? Why, Mr. President, he said, because they're wrong. And I'm afraid that a lot of our societal debates now are we feel sorry for anybody who disagrees with us because they're wrong. We actually do this in three stages. If you look at somebody who disagrees with you in any of the culture wars now, uh, we start out and we say, oh, well, they're not agreeing with me. Okay. Well, that's because he's ignorant. He doesn't have all the facts. So I'm going to give him all the facts. Here's why it's obvious that we should build a wall, right? You know, uh, it's obvious. You know, here are the facts. Here's what immigration is doing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, we all argue about what the real facts are. And he still doesn't agree. Oh, well, that doesn't mean he's ignorant anymore. That means that uh, he's stupid. I can write him off as, you know, not just deficient in facts, but deficient in thinking ability. He's just stupid. Can't you see? It's obvious. Here's the argument. Here are the facts. Still not agreeing. Now where do we get? Evil. He's evil. Oh, yeah, I had an uh, acquaintance who, well, yeah, call him a friend, you know, and this was back, I don't know, four or five years ago, and he was sitting there going on. There was a little alcohol involved. He was <laughs> sitting there going on about something that President Obama had done, and he said that he had reached the conclusion, based on this pattern of behavior, that the problem was that the president was evil, well, that's a pretty big statement to make. Now, <clears throat> pardon me while I gag, <laughs> but if we look at the current occupant in the White House, there are many people who would sit there and say he's evil mm. without taking, and I'm not saying I'm agreeing with his policies, all right? Without taking the time to sit there and say, well, let's look at the facts, logic, argument, whatever, that are behind this policy. And the quickest way to write people off now, where you can combine stupid and evil in one word, is you, you start throwing privilege accusations around. And uh, you can only say that because you're an educated white male, you know, whatever. Or you can only say that because, and, and so we try to always make these equations where they're not bilateral. And we write you off as a hater or we write you know. This is 
actually going back to a much earlier era in history, when you got the wars of religion in Europe and when you got, you know, the various other pitched battles of that sort. You just write people off. Or you sit there and do it on the basis of science and write people off on, you know, some racial or ethnic basis and they end up in death camps. Uh, when we start doing that in the church with each other, we are not exactly showing forth the light of the gospel. Uh, there are many, many things I disagree with my fellow presbyters about vehemently. You know what? They're all trying to serve and follow Jesus Christ. That seems to me a basis upon which we can work together. But what we see in these sine waves is we're always on the slope of some curve, so there's always going to be a battle. It's like, you know, Heraclitus is the prophet of, you know, all theology, that the only thing permanent is change, right? You know? And uh, nobody believes in permanence anymore in our secular society. Why should they believe in it in the church? Yeah. The only thing that's real is change. The only thing that's constant is change, right? Yeah. And if you're not, we can write you off. You're an old guy, you know, <laughs> or something like that. You're a dead white European male or, you know, up in the North Woods with beef jerky and an AK. And, you know, <laughs> Maybe I'm going to get my water purification tablets and some antibiotics. And On that happy note, uh, we'll... Uh, Take an extra long lunch hour. Thank you.
back to the feeling of as much as I am uninformed and, and not in the know, my faith is very strong. So I, so you are giving she me like a wrong story. Since 2016, I gave it a 2018 version. Well, I mean, they're essentially the same, but I didn't change them. <laughs> well, I'm glad they're this Yes, I want one. Are you bringing sandwiches back here then? We can do that. Yeah. Okay. All right, let me, I gotta run to the bathroom. We're gonna run down and get stuff at the deli. This is all turned off, correct? It's I'm not streaming. So I pressed, and I, I'm not sure if I pressed the right button because I thought it was one that would be like lit up. Right. And I just pressed this one because to me that says off. Then we eat our lunch at that bar table just in case. Okay, that sounds even yes. better. Yes. Yeah. I'll tell her we the library. Okay, hey, that works. This is comfy in there, too. Yeah. These chairs are killing me. I can tell you. I know, me too. I keep leaning back, and then I'm like, oh, I hope I'm not getting in Bobby's way to no. like see, because I'm like, I, I, I guess I, 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 yeah. I realize how um, out of shape I am yeah. when I can't have any and I'm like, oh, God, I can't. Okay, that's 
sounds good? No, I've got. Yeah, I've got water. I've got everything.
Uh, they're picking up sandwiches and then. But you're done with class? Oh, we're done, yeah. I really need to have you text me or something. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm 